the greatest tragic meteorite story never told. Little is known of what should be the largest known meteorite in the United States, found by a Tacoma man in 1907, but a curse is the only thing that followed him and the men involved. In December of 1907, the largest meteorite in the country was discovered in Washington State by a Tacoma man, Horace Greeley Harold, a private timber cruiser for the Washington State Forestry Service, a year after the sale of the Willamette meteorite from Oregon. In December of 1907, 190 miles north of Clackamas, Oregon, in the Mount Baker's newly formed National Forest, Horace G. Harold, a 33-year-old timber cruiser, while doing research, stumbled upon a large metal stone. Its massive measurements struck Horace to the ground. It had divots instead of holes, and viewed through a loop showed green olivine crystals infused in the iron, later known to be called a palisite meteorite. Horace knew he wasn't about to sneak this out of the forest without notice, and if he could drag it back to Tacoma, he would have to build a large barn to enclose it. However, he knew what he found was worth money, and a lot of it. Knowing that he was on federal land and not wanting to get into any kind of legal battle, he contacts the district forester headquarters in Portland, Oregon, a letter to Gifford Pinchot, and instead of writing back, Pinchot sends a supervisor to locate the stone. Horace, a few years earlier, sold a meteorite from Ohio to the Smithsonian, so he knew how to handle these transactions. He also knew that all Ellis Hughes received, the finder of the Willamette meteorite a year earlier, was a sore back and a hole in his yard. On December 24th of 1907, the Spokane Chronicle writes about Horace's find. Meteorite, Whatcom Timber Cruiser discovers one in foothills of Baker Mountain. H.G. Harold, a timber cruiser and mining man of Tacoma, has found one of the largest meteorites ever discovered a short distance from the Bellingham Bay and the British Columbia Railroad in Whatcom County, and is now negotiating with the museum connected with the Columbia University of New York for the sale of the curiosity, states at Westside Report. The aerolite is four foot thick, six foot wide by ten foot in length, and its discovery was only by the nearest accident. Mr. Harold had been up in the foothills west of Mount Baker, looking at a strip of timberland and was returning to Bellingham. While transversing a strip of rough country in the Nooksack Basin, he saw the meteorite, and attracted by its peculiar appearance and the, and the manner in which it projected from the earth, he stopped to examine it. It was of such a refractory character that he could not chip or make any impression upon it with the back of his axe. But he was convinced from the color of the monolith and the disturbance that had been made in the earth around the spot that it was indeed a meteorite. Hardest of meteorite iron. He had traveled through the locality before and remembering that a miner's cabin was a short distance away, he secured an old rusty pick and by dint of much labor, chipped off a piece of the meteorite, revealing the fact that it was composed of the hardest of meteorite iron. Keeping his discovery a secret, he wrote to the managers of the Columbia Museum and a few days ago received a reply asking him to send a sample of the meteorite for inspection. The later states that its dimensions make it one of the two largest ever found and that the strange visitant from interstellar space is worth $2,000 to the museum. The monolith will weigh about 100 tons according to the estimate made by Mr. Harold and the cost of moving it from statements made in the letter from the museum will be enormous. Mr. Harold has made arrangements to forward within a few days a fragment from the meteorite, and it is probable that within a short time, a representative from the museum will make a trip to the Northwest to investigate the matter. Sunk deep in the earth, the meteorite struck the earth just on the crest of a sharp hogback, or a cleaver separating two watercourses. From the appearance of the earth surrounding, Mr. Harold is convinced that it came through the heavens angling from a southeasterly direction. The impact when it struck the earth must have been terrific, as it plunged downward through a very hard formation of clay, about five feet, before its course was arrested throwing up a surf of soil, roots, gravel, and clay. The spot is about five miles from the railroad mentioned, and while the slope of the country is all downward to the tracks, Mr. Harold is by no means certain that the meteor can be moved out of the wild country in which he found it without enormous expense. He has carefully located the place, however, and feels confident that he has made a very rare find, and one of which he will realize several thousands of dollars. This is not the first time that Mr. Harold has sold a meteorite. Years ago in Ohio, from which state he comes, a meteor about the size of a bushel basket fell in a piece of meadowland, and the owner of the farm, witnessing the phenomenon, promptly dug it out of the earth, and with much difficulty took it into his home. Harold happened to see it and was told its story. He wrote to the Smithsonian Institution, sending a small fragment of the meteorite. The institution promptly wrote back, offering him $100 for it. 
He refused, and the institution finally paid $300. The Spokane Chronicle, December 24th of 1907. On Friday, January 31st, 1908, one month after Horace's find, Forrester Gifford G. Pinchot issued a press release. Harold may not get big meteorite. If Forrester Pinchot finds it on Forest Reservoir land, government will claim it. January 31st. According to instructions issued by Forrest Gifford Pinchot to the National Forest Force, H.G. Harold of Tacoma may not be able to remove the big meteorite which he claims to have found in the foothills near Mount Baker recently. Mr. Pinchot believes that the meteorite may be within the National Forest Reserve, and if that is the case, Harold will not be allowed to move it. All the foresters have been instructed to keep on the lookout for the meteorite. Mr. Harold has not confided to anyone the exact location of the meteorite, so the foresters are working in the dark. They will make a thorough search, however, in the hope of preventing the sale of the meteorite. According to Harold's story, the meteorite is one of the largest ever discovered and is probably 2,500 years old. A distraught Mr. Harold was put in touch with the mayor of Olympia, William A. Hagemeyer, because of Mayor Hagemeyer's years of experience with the Native Americans. The Lummi tribe in particular had extensive knowledge of visitors from heaven and regularly traded in meteorites and fossils that had been with the tribes for many generations. As Native Americans were converted to Christianity, people like William Hegemeyer convinced the Nooksack and Lummi people that their traditions of visitors from heaven were pagan and to give up the idols in trade for tobacco. Horace makes a deal with William Hagemeyer sometime before the 4th of July celebration of 1908 when Hagemeyer meets with the Native American chiefs. If he was to win this court case against the forestry, Horace would share in the profits of the sale of the meteorite. Horace was apprehensive to show the location of the meteorite. However, William reported that he could not help without witnessing the stone for himself. The two made a pact to keep the location a secret. On December 23, 1908, Horace Greeley Harold marries Victoria Georgina Roger, a 25-year-old woman from England, an acquaintance of Jesse Hagemeyer, exactly a year after Horace found the Iron Stone. What Horace didn't know was that William Hagemeyer was putting together a plan to buy Horace Harold out. Mayor Hagemeyer owned the two most popular cigar news and fruit stands in the state, sitting across from each other on 4th Street in Olympia at the Capitol Building. Hagemeyer, trading in tobacco with the Puget Sound Native Americans, gave him special privileges on the reservations. For the July 4th celebrations in Olympia, Hagemeyer was able to secure a few war canoes for races for several 4th of July celebrations. Mayor William Hagemeyer was no stranger to controversy. His father committed suicide when he was nine years old. A 54-year-old cobbler from Hanover, Germany, August Hagemeyer was a loyal Freemason. Right before William turned 16 years of age in 1889, the Freemasons nominated and elected him to be the first page and messenger of the newly formed Washington State, sworn in on July 6, 1889. He remained the state's capital messenger for several years. He was named escort in the Whitman of the World for the Pacific Northwest in 1897, while also being a clerk for the Chamber of Commerce that same year. In 1889, he was accepted into the Freemasons' Harmony Lodge and elected into the Republican Party. His position of capital messenger was useful to the Brotherhood, going back to when William was a young boy. In 1900, William Hagemeyer, now age 28, was named treasurer of the civic conventions and through the next two years hosted the Chamber of Commerce meetings. His Democratic peers in Olympia were starting to see who Mr. Hagemeyer really was and poked fun at his spoiled, mama's boy-like attitude. The local paper weekly had jabs, ridicule, and name-calling for William or Billy for those with a brave soul. In 1901, his dog was even poisoned by those that did not agree with his politics. In 1902, W.A. Hagemeyer joins the Fraternal Order of the Eagles and is also elected delegate for the Woodmen of the World. On August 1st that same year, Will is invited to Cripple Creek, Colorado, where he is a part of writing new legislation for the sale of tobacco, and plans are drawn up to change the laws regarding the election of governor for the state of Washington. The case against the governor was written in such a way to intimidate the current Republican governor, Henry McBride, to reside and not to run in the next election. The Freemasons and Woodmen of the World had someone else in mind and used William Hagemeyer to do their bidding. The Supreme Court voted against Hagemeyer's case and Henry McBride remained governor of Washington State. The first question presented is, does the death of the governor cause a vacancy in that office which may be filled by an election for the unexpired term? And if not, does the office of lieutenant governor become vacant when the incumbent assumes the duties of governor? 
In the spring of 1904, William Hegemeyer is involved with setting up the Native American elders with Ellis Hughes just across the border in Oregon for the trial involving the Willamette meteorite. While William is abroad, he meets Jessica Delilah Hendricks, a Chehalis woman, and they marry in April of 1904. April 15, 1904. William A. Hegemeyer takes to wed Jessica Jessie Delilah Hendricks of Chehalis, Washington. Olympia, April 15th, the wedding of William A. Hegemeyer and Miss Jessie Hendricks took place tonight at the residence of the groom's mother, Miss Johanna Hegemeyer. The ceremony was performed by Reverend R. M. Hayes of the Presbyterian Church at 8.30 o'clock in the presence of a few intimate friends and relatives. Miss Emma Meir of Lincoln, Nebraska acted as bridesmaid, and F. A. Anspach of Tacoma was best man. The residence was lavishly decorated with cut flowers, the room in which the ceremony took place being a perfect bower of roses. Mr. Hagemeyer is a prosperous businessman of the city. He filled the office of city treasurer for two terms under a previous administration and has always been prominent in local politics. The bride is a beautiful and talented young lady whose relatives reside at Chehalis. The happy couple will leave Saturday for an extended wedding trip through Oregon and California. Special Dispatch to the Ledger, April 15, 1904. The honeymoon was put off until July 23rd and started off at the Donnelly Hotel in Tacoma, Washington, where the couple enjoyed several days in the full luxury of a wedding suite. They then boarded a train to Oregon to show Jesse the Tamanawos at the Lewis and Clark Exposition and then on to California. Jesse and William returned home to Olympia, and William was hard at work doing his daily hustle. He wanted to be present at his cigarette stands as they opened at 5 and during closing at 8. He campaigned to supply the state with tobacco starting with the soldiers' home contract and on to the prisons and asylums of the state. This was the sole reason for his journey through so many of the fraternities and brotherhoods. By 1905, he was behind the scenes gathering bidding information so that he could underbid his adversaries. On May 13, 1905, William Francis or Huck Hagemeyer was born nine months after their honeymoon. Jessie had her friends to dote over little Huck, but now William A. was leaving his wife home most nights to care for the baby. On occasion, his mother Joanne watched and cared for the child when both William and Jessie needed to be seen together. In the 1905 election for state governor, the Republicans and Masonic Lodge elected in Governor Albert E. Meade. Governor Meade, within his first year, made enemies with the fraternities, the same men that worked four years to put him in office. He antagonized them by urging an increase in railroad taxes. Meade also supported legislation establishing a railroad commission and acts establishing a state highway commission, a state tax commission, and a state bank examiner, all of which angered the fraternities. January 1906 brought William A. his 14th degree in the Harmony Masonics Lodge. Jessie had out-of-town family, and she made several trips back to Chehalis. This kept her busy and off of William's back. By this time, William had his fingers woven all through the fabric of the community. The tobacco contracts were bringing in cash beyond his wildest dreams. After the San Francisco fire of 1906, Masonic friends from the Terminus Hotel in San Francisco presented to Billy a burnt souvenir for display at his North Cigar Stand to compete with his two six-foot wooden Indian chiefs that, up until this point, were favorites of the children walking down either side of 4th Street. William thought the large wood carvings were the reason for his tobacco and cigar successes. They were the biggest and most colorful tobacco Indians in town, and William made sure everyone knew it. Wait till they see my giant cigar. He had one being made for the city with his name painted on the side, and it came to be known as the Giant Hagemeyer Cigar from the Cigar Factory. William moved his family around several times through this period of his life, trying to stay away from prying eyes and busy bodies, but mostly to keep Jessie happy. She entertained the wives of the fraternities and played her part with William's cronies, but she was not happy with the city, and she wanted badly to move to the country and out of the city life. Unfortunately for Jesse and her son, William was just beginning to get busy. His friends and business partners said he should run for mayor and run this city like he does his cigar and newsstands. In early 1907, William August Hagemeyer started his campaign for mayor of Washington State's capital, Olympia. As the campaign progressed throughout the year, Jesse demanded to get away. Little Huck, at three years old, and Jesse traveled back and forth between Seattle, Tacoma, and Chehalis. They were only home in Olympia for short periods of time. Married life was not William's strong suit, and he and Jesse drifted apart. He was a hustler, and he couldn't stop his hustle. Now he was about to become mayor of Olympia at the age of 33. Not everyone in Olympia shared William's thirst for power and prestige. On August 21, 1908, the Washington Standard paper wrote a three-column piece called Simply Boys Play. 
When the name of Mr. Hagemeyer, the present mayor, was suggested for that high office at the last municipal election, it was for a time regarded as a joke. Nobody, not even his best friends, considering his aspirations, warranted even a remote possibility of his being nominee of either party or faction, requiring so much ability for credible performance of duty or responsibility for results. The story in the paper went on with insults and debauchery and ended with, It is safe to say that by his unwise course, the spirit of friendly cooperation so essential in such matters is by no means promoted, and it is generally conceded that the mayor can do less harm by confining himself to the issue of proclamations on every possible occasion, and continuing the use of an animated talking machine to make his public speeches, rather than in shaping policies of which he knows little and seems to care less. The Washington Standard, August 21st, 1908. Shortly after William was elected mayor, Jesse and their son Huck left for almost the entire year, only coming home for formal mayor's duties. William didn't listen to those who scoffed. He had bigger plans and he wasn't going to let those around him, including his wife, discourage his aspirations. It certainly wasn't quiet while Jesse and their son were away. After William donated his giant cigar to the city, he started work on his patent for a contraption that turned a meat slicer into a tobacco trimmer. If there were to be a tax-free law for leaf tobacco, then a trimmer is the one thing you'll need above all else. In August of 1908, Mayor W.A. Hagemeyer pleads guilty to breaking the Byerly anti-cigarette law. Olympia Mayor is fined $10 in costs. Pleads guilty to charge of selling cigarettes. Trapped by W.H. Davis, leader in the Civic League. Olympia, August 31st. W.A. Hagemeyer, mayor of Olympia, today pled guilty in Justice Milton Giles' court to selling manufactured cigarettes contrary to the Byerly anti-cigarette law and was fined $10 in costs. The complaint was filed by W.H. Davis, a leader in the Civic League, a local civic purity organization. Mr. Davis previously worked up several cases against local saloons for selling liquor to minors and the Sunday law violation. The mayor owns a cigar stand on the north side of 4th Street and a cigar and fruit stand on the south side of the street in the same block. It was alleged in the complaint that the cigarettes were sold by the mayor on the south side stand to some young men who had been used to gather the evidence. Deputy City Attorney Will Maynard, a son-in-law of Davis, was removed from office tonight by Mayor Hegemeyer. The Washington Standard, August 31, 1908. This new degrading attention is not the kind William wanted. He needed to distance himself from the stands, at least until he was done playing mayor for the year. He needed someone he could trust, so he spoke to his wife's friend, Alice Frances McNamara, and hired her husband, Robert Taylor, who had been working in the ice trade for the Taylor Brothers of Olympia. Jesse finally got her way and moved out to the country with Baby Huck. With William now free, he was staying at the brand new Neyland Hotel right in front of the cigar and fruit stand a few blocks from the Capitol buildings. At the Neyland Hotel, William Hagemeyer did most of his shady dealings, and is where he and Horace Harold hashed out their plan to win the meteorite from Pinchot. William A. Hagemeyer and Horace G. Harold are awaiting the answer from Gifford Pinchot on whether or not he will be able to remove the meteorite from the National Forest. In January of 1909, Governor Meade lost the nomination and was ousted by the Republican Party. The Masonic Lodge made sure that Samuel Cosgrove would be nominated by spreading out the first vote landing Samuel in the governor's chair on the second vote. However, as the new governor gave his acceptance speech, he became too weak to complete his address during his inaugural ceremony. He was granted a leave of absence. He went to Paso Robles in California to recuperate, but never recovered and died there two months later. His body was returned to the Capitol Rotunda and buried in the Masonic Cemetery in Olympia. There were whispers in the Capitol's halls of foul play. This was a blow to the Brotherhood and slowed the plan to run Washington State. A rigged election wasn't going to work for a second time without notice. William Hagemeyer's 1902 failed Supreme Court case regarding the death of a governor becomes relevant. But because of the standing federal law, the elected lieutenant governor, who lives in Spokane, assumed the position of governor of the state of Washington, Governor Marion E. Hay. Governor Hay had no ties to the Masonic Harmony Lodge, and unlike the two Republican governors before Cosgrove, Hay focused in on corruption in state government, and he called a special session of the legislation to investigate and impeach dishonest state officials. He also supported amendments to the state constitution, allowing initiatives, referendums, recall of public officials, and women's suffrage. During the year and a half of state bureaucracy with Horace Harold's meteorite, Mayor Hagemeyer was somehow able to pull strings and convince the government to allow Horace G. Harold to remove the meteorite from the National Forest. Hagemeyer paraded his power over Pinchot and made enemies that ultimately ended his government career. On May 10, 1909, the Bellington Herald reported that the government had made its decision. Seattle, May 10th. 
In his mail today, Horace G. Harold, a timber cruiser who lives in Tacoma, will receive official notification that, that the United States government will place no obstacles in the way of his removing from the Washington National Forest the huge meteorite weighing between 11 and 12 tons, which he discovered on or about December 20th, 1907, and which is said to be the largest known meteorite in the world, the Bellingham Herald, May 10th, 1909. Horace Harold was now in debt with William Hagemeyer for his involvement in procuring of the meteorite. William tells Horace he can find a buyer, but it would have to be kept a secret. The buyers did not want attention and moving it was not only to be expensive, but nearly impossible to do covertly. While waiting on the forestry's answer, William connected with the Lummi tribe and they warned him that if the holy rock had been located, that it was not to be disturbed or a bad spirit would follow the men that desecrate the site. Upon hearing that, the Brotherhood wanted to object to his $5,000 asking price, starting to jump to the tens of thousands of dollars, which Hagemeyer had to settle Mr. Harold down, letting him know that the favor of procuring the meteorite was worth just as much. During the negotiations and 12 days after the letter from the forestry, on May 22, 1909, Victoria, Horace's wife, was awaiting her husband on the corner of 9th and Commerce Street in Tacoma. When Horace arrived, he witnessed Albert Cahilla, a visitor to the Northwest, wink and smile at his wife while passing by. Horace grabbed his wife and followed Mr. Cahilla into a tailor shop where he confronted him. The fight moved into the street where Mr. Harold pulled out a gun and threatened to knock his block off. Mr. Cahilla pressed charges on Mr. Harold, who was then arrested and let out on $100 bail. Superior court jury finds Harold guilty. Accused of brandishing revolver in threatening manner, the jurymen recommending leniency for him, Harold, who with his wife took the stand yesterday, testified that Cahilla winked and smiled at Mrs. Harold while she stood at the corner of 9th and Commerce Street, waiting for her husband to appear. She informed her husband and together they followed Cahilla to the tailor shop. Harold confessed that he pulled his gun and threatened to knock his block off. The jury convinced that Horace had no other choice but to threaten the abused, said that they had to convict because it was the law. However, they pleaded with the judge to be lenient, stating it was not Harris's fault. Mr. Hagemeyer got the charges dropped for Mr. Harold, but when the accuser, Mr. Cahilla, found out, he was able to file another complaint. Two months later, Horace was again found guilty and served one day in jail, as well as a fine for $14.80. Mayor William A. Hagemeyer convinced Horace Harold to sell the meteorite with a promise of support in any of his future endeavors as well as help with his legal matters. Victoria and Horace had a year-old baby girl, Frances, and a newborn son. On July 11, 1910, Horace and Victoria lost their son, not yet a month old. Victoria is deathly ill at this point and learns through her lawyer that Horace had divorced her. No spousal or child support for his one-year-old daughter was given, so Victoria filed suit and with the lawyer's help was able to show to a judge that Horace had illegally filed for divorce. Victoria rapidly healed from her illness as soon as Horace was moved out, and on August 17th, just one month later, Victoria is granted a divorce from Horace and is awarded $50 a month and custody of their daughter for the first three years, and Horace would retain the child thereafter. They were married only two and a half years. Horace appeals the decision and while awaiting an answer on September 26, 1910, Horace G. Harold, a timber cruiser who describes himself as a government land agent, was arrested yesterday by city detectives Huckabee and Brady for tapping the Secret Service telephone lines of the home telephone company. There was nothing cheap about Harold's system for acquainting himself with conversations passing over the line. He says he suspected that his divorced wife was receiving messages from admirers, so he quartered himself in a vacant house at 1019 South 9th Street, where a home telephone was installed, tapped the trunk line with expensive apparatus, and hired a small boy to sit at the telephone during the day and record all calls and conversations that went to the home occupied by Harold's divorced wife. The kid had a snap and was sorry when his job was ended by the police detectives. He worked the day shift, and Harold sat with the headgear receiver over his ears during the evening when he imagined there might be something doing. Whether Harold's jealous superstitions were confirmed has not yet been divulged, but nevertheless the police say it is a fact that Harold's tapping invention worked like a charm. The kid who sat with the receiver over his ears soon got to know everybody's business in that neighborhood, and his job, according to him, was a lead pipe cinch and a picnic. Harold feared that he would suffer from NUI and thus failed to catch every word of conversation, so he bought a small-sized library of picture books and magazines so that the boy would have lots to occupy his mind while not prying into the affairs of neighbors. 
Last Friday the 23rd, too, was the Jonah day for Harold, for a woman who's contemplating renting the vacant house obtained the key from the owner and started out to view the premises. After letting herself into the hall, she was startled to see the boy sitting at a table, an operator's receiver over his head, and coils of tapping wire connected with the telephone in the hallway. She finally decided to take the house, but objected strenuously to having Harold maintaining his lonely vigil during the night and the much interested kid hitting at the contraption all day. So she ordered Harold to skidoo, invention and all. Harold objected strongly and said he had the owner's permission to use the place. The owner went back on him, however, and when Harold got too insistent yesterday morning, the new leasers of the house called for the police city detectives, Brady and Huckabee, who were sent to investigate and found the kid right on the job. W.D. Tyler agreed to swear out a complaint against Harold and did so in Justice Frank Gavin's court. Harold was arrested at 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon and produced $50 cash bail for his release, pending a hearing. The timber cruiser made no attempt to deny that he had tapped the telephone wires, and he told Detective Brady that it was a good thing that the arrest was not made 30 minutes later, because he would have had a gun in his pocket by that time, asserting that he always carried a gun. He tapped the wires, he said, to try and gain proof that his ex-wife was not a fit person to have the custody of their child. There was no law under which he could be prosecuted for the measures he adopted to obtain the evidence desired. Harold, several months ago, appeared before Justice Frank Graham, and after a long litigation, paid a fine for beating a Commerce Street tailor with a revolver, because of an imaginary insult to Mrs. Harold. The divorce followed since then. The Tacoma Daily Ledger, September 27, 1910. Hagemeyer told Harold to lay low and not to bring any more attention his way or the dealer could back out and leave them both without a deal. He had just sold both of his cigar stands and was now in the process of purchasing the Neeland Hotel in Olympia, where he had been staying for the past few years, away from his wife Jesse and his son Huck. William had his own troubles when Jesse became pregnant and had a baby girl, Eunice, on October 3, 1910. William insisted that Eunice was not his child and therefore ostracized the family by staying away. On the two occasions that William and Horace traveled north to visit the meteorite, Horace divulged that his month-old son that passed was not his either. They lamented over their wife's woes and bonded over their anger towards the two women. Meanwhile, on December 26th, Jessie, William's wife, and her son Huck traveled to Tacoma and visited friends for several weeks. Five days later, on the morning of December 31st, 1910, Horace and four men drove to his ex-wife's house on 914 South J Street in Tacoma, Washington, to take his baby girl, Frances. A fight ensued between the men, Victoria, and her elderly mother. Baby Frances was tossed around. Victoria produces a gun and shoots the man, grabbing at her daughter. Horace and the two others dash away in a large automobile, while the remaining two kidnappers, one being shot in the groin, stumbled into a store blocks away. The police are called and one of the kidnappers tell the police they didn't know it was a kidnapping. Before the day is out, the chauffeur, Harold, and one other are found hiding in the woods. Everyone goes to jail, including Victoria. She said calmly, I'd do it again if it would save my baby. With Horace behind bars, William was in a pickle after traveling north by himself to retrace the path to the meteorite, but to no avail. He was lost in the unfamiliar forest, so back to the Lummy Reservation he went. He persuaded one of the elders to follow him 60 miles east of the reservation and another five miles from the train tracks, up the base of the mountain. He soon realized that areas were looking familiar, and before they knew it, they were standing in a clearing and there it was, gleaming in the cold winter sun. The Lummi native elder began a ritual right in front of the object. He started to dig aside the meteorite and dug up a pile of curious stones of all shapes and sizes. There were small red round stones that they called the first seeds of life. These were offered up to protect their tribe. The native elder told him when he was a young boy before the reservations, he made this pilgrimage and placed a, sac a sacred red seed that he received from the medicine man into this same hole, aside the meteorite as an offering into manhood. He traveled on foot from the water's edge, 65 miles east to Mount Baker, known to the Lummi people as Como Kulshan, the Great White Watcher. William was told once again that the site was not to be disturbed. The two men departed the sacred space, and this time William took notes as to which way to travel back to the site. Horace, on the other hand, was sitting in the Pierce County Jail in Tacoma awaiting trial, while his ex-wife, Victoria, now released, Victoria was telling the press of her two and a half years of living hell with Horace. From day one of her marriage, she explained of all manner of abuse. Horace would say he would kill himself or her if she took his daughter from her. She slept with a butcher knife under her pillow because she was so frightened of him. Before their son died, he would take the baby out for hours, asking women around the town if the baby looked like him, because he felt that she had been unfaithful. 
Her account went on for some time. Those involved were said to tear up as she retold of her trials from Horace. Williams stopped all communications with Horace because of the bad media. The local people marked Horace, once a respected real estate man, now as a lunatic. Horace sent a message by way of an inmate to William to get with his lawyer and to help with these matters. William assured Horace's lawyer that while he did not have the courts in his back pocket, he did have the prisons and asylums on his side and was doing everything he could and not to worry. He convinced Horace to transfer his properties and possessions into a trusted hand that William could be in control of while Horace was imprisoned. As the days passed, the bad news mounted for Horace Harold. Was this the bad omen warned by the Lummi Native Americans? While in county jail, Horace suffers from pneumonia and doctors say was deathly ill for a time, but healed rapidly. He started to write anyone associated with jail policy, reporting of the horrible conditions he was in. In October 1911, the man Victoria shot succumbed to the bullet and died at St. Joseph Hospital in Tacoma. By this time, the public was blaming Horace for everything that was wrong with Tacoma. Four months later, Mr. Hagemeyer's wife, Jessica, Jesse Delilah Hendricks Hagemeyer, dies suddenly of digestion issues at 31 years of age after a visit with her doctor. William sends the children all over the Puget Sound to several families from Seattle to Chehalis while he was out doing business and only visiting when necessary. On March 29, 1911, after three months of fighting, Horace is found guilty, and the two living and one deceased accomplices are found to be innocent and were tricked into the kidnapping by Mr. Harold. Horace was now convicted. The state's minimum prison term was not less than 10 years to be served. However, the judge in the case gave Horace a chance at half the minimum, 5 to 15 year sentence in the state prison, depending on his good behavior. Horace Harold filed an appeal and stayed in the county jail in Tacoma, fighting daily to get free. In June 1911, Victoria's lawyers start a fight for support. Victoria pleads to the judge that Horace is worth $40,000 and she hasn't a dime. What Horace had left after moving everything into William's care was a gold watch and a chain and $91. A year earlier, a judge granted her $50 a month spousal and child support, which Mr. Harold had not paid since his incarceration. In October of 1911, Horace, still in the county jail almost one year, engineered an escape with two other inmates but was foiled by a jailer. The escape included hiding a file in a fruit can and two individuals on the outside helping. William gets word to Horace through his lawyer not to escape and to plead insanity. William has power at the asylum and could pull strings for an early release after recovery from his insanity in less than five years. Horace is told that he has already been convicted and that an insanity plea was off the table. He would have to serve his prison sentence. November 1911 brought a toothache among many other complaints Horace had against the county jail. He got shackled going to the dentist and was paraded downtown. The judge came down to the jail and was served dinner by a murderer waiting to hang to prove that Mr. Harold's complaints weren't warranted about the jail food. Horace decided he wanted to fight his own case and requested law books to study. Although many that read his letters said he was quite gifted for only studying for a few weeks, but they laughed behind his back. Horace fired his attorneys and plans to plead his own case. After a few weeks of study, the judge told Horace he cannot plead his own case. During this time in jail, Horace sees himself as a real litigator and writes legal letters for the inmates as well as for himself. Horace, in June of 1912, 17 months after his arrest, lost his appeal despite his weeks of studying and left for prison to serve his 5 to 15 years with 17 months already served. Mr. Harold was said to have been the worst unruly prisoner they had at the Pierce County Jail since its opening and they were glad to see him leave Tacoma. With Horace away to prison in Walla Walla, William left for Chehalis to visit the children. After the press died down for Horace, William pulls strings one last time and in April of 1913, Horace is found insane and is transferred to the insane asylum to finish out his sentence. Because of the corruption in Olympia, William retired from the state capitol after serving for over 24 years. He was 39 in 1913. William assured Horace that he would return his valuable property and the monies resulting from the sale of the meteorite when he was released and it was safe to do so. William never divulged to Horace that a trove of curious stones were also recovered from the site and were now in his possession. If there was a curse, it seemed to have landed on the poor, insane Mr. Harold locked up at Medical Lake near Spokane. In May of 1913, William sold the Neelan Hotel in Olympia and bought the Monogram Saloon from Captain A.J. Stores at, at 1009 Pacific Avenue. He plans new reservations for the entire district and to make the Monogram Saloon into the Hagemeyer, just like his grandfather in Hanover, Germany, who named his the Hagemeyer. 
Although being in the finest part of Tacoma, the Hegemeyer brought in a tough crowd. Weekly, there were high-profile court cases starting or ending in the bar. On December 25, 1913, a chauffeur was thrown out of the saloon for being obnoxious and fell between the wheels of an outside moving automobile and died. It became national headlines. Hagemeyer was glad that his name on the saloon still bore the name of the monogram so that the press did not disparage the Hagemeyer name. In 1914, a patron commits suicide by drinking acid and makes headlines just one more bad publicity for the bar. After a year in the paper, the chauffeur's death case was dismissed as an accident, but the bad press just kept coming. In 1915, one of Williams' partners, Mayor Mottman, on his second term as Olympia's mayor, was being investigated by several federal institutions. He was being sued by the Taylor brothers of Olympia. He was the president of a shady oil company in which he had to resign. The mayor also had shady properties and leases throughout the Puget Sound. His time in the courts made William nervous of what would be said about his partners, and he started looking to replace him or to buy him out. A partner would be hard to find while the state was fighting federal and state laws prohibiting the sales of liquor and beer. William had all of his money in the saloon, and most of his competition was converting their saloons into soda fountain shops. The Taylor Brothers, Oxford and Olympia, was turning its now famous saloon into a bowling alley and a soda shop. William was too far into his saloon to turn back and bet on this dry state ordeal to blow over, so he pushed on. In March of the same year, a warrant for William A. Hagemeyer was issued by the local courts for assaulting F. H. Turner in his own saloon. He was quickly arrested in front of his peers and he was furious. Months later, he was again in the news for having ladies loitering in the saloon. They were taken into custody and charged fines that William discreetly paid. In Olympia, things weren't getting any better for William. Although he was staying away from the capital, he still had property to sell. At times, he would sell to more than one buyer on the same plot of land. In December, he was sued in Olympia for his shady practices. He lost these lawsuits and paid out over $850 in fines. On New Year's Eve of 1915, a boxer named Romeo Hagen, the handsome baker, was arrested in the Hagemeyer. Romeo had been recently kicked out of the city of Seattle by a judge who had had enough of his fighting in the streets. This arrest made the paper by the fact he was the last person of 1915 to be arrested and the first person in 1916 to be tossed in jail. It was about this time that William took a break and went to Chehalis, Washington to see Huck and Eunice. They had been away for so long that Eunice barely knew who he was. Huck begged to come back home, and William agreed. Although they returned to Tacoma, they stayed with William's friends from the Eagles local lodge, Mr. and Mrs. Fred Harmon. In 1917, the Harmons were urging William to take a wife so that the children could start to feel like a family again. No one knew of William's dislike for his late wife's daughter, Eunice. Huck begged his father to accept Eunice as he had himself. He didn't know the reason for his father's dislike of her. Because of this, Huck was a very protective older brother, and although William was reserved, he respected his son's fervor to keep Eunice safe. November 1917 brought sad news to the Hagemeyer family. Johann Charlotte Eleanor Meyer Hagemeyer passed away in Olympia at the age of 80. The Puritan groups were causing headaches for all saloon owners in Tacoma, and new restrictions were being placed on the properties. By this time, liquor license holders could not buy alcohol out of state, and only a small ration per every 20 days could be bought and sold to patrons. I should have stayed in tobacco, William thought. He couldn't believe this was really coming his way. He had just heard that the government was going to restrict the sales of alcohol to doctor's prescriptions, eliminating the need for saloons altogether. William was not able to keep the payoffs paying off. The saloon went into decay. At the age of 44, William gets married to Marcia Louise Stewart of Canada. They live in Tacoma and bring William's two children into the new union. By 1919, William needed to find another path for his employment. With the saloon gone and most of his property sold or lost in court cases, William's Freemason friends find him a place with the U.S. Custom Agencies as an officer on the pier. William starts a little Chinese mercantile shop in Chinatown and starts to trade in opium and sets up several opium dens with the remaining properties he has in Tacoma. In 1921, William and Marcia have a daughter named Ruth Stewart Hagemeyer and they moved into a bigger home in Tacoma off of 86th Street. In 1924, the family moved again to J Street in Tacoma. In 1926, on William McDowell's farm, just two blocks from Mr. Hagemeyer's home, a meteorite is found and Hagemeyer helps with the sale. The meteorite is named the Tacoma. On June 3, 1928, tragedy strikes the Hagemeyers by the death of William's second wife by accidental poisoning by the pharmacist. 
On June, about a quarter of a mile east of Hagemeyer's home, Ellis McCammon, foreman for the Tacoma Park Board, who had spent most of his life prospecting for rare metals in all parts of the world, uncovered a three-ton chondrite meteorite while excavating for a new park. In 1929, William's son Huck marries Vivian Krusner and takes Eunice with him. William is left with Ruth, his youngest, and moves in his first wife's friend Alice Taylor from Olympia as a maid. Ruth, as she gets older, understands that Alice is more than a maid and starts to clash with her father and Alice. On March 9, 1932, at the Medical Lake Asylum near Spokane, Horace dies at the age of 57. He spent 24 years there. Eight years go by, and Alice moves out because of the strife with Ruth. William has lost all but his one small home on J Street. William continued to work on the pier in downtown Tacoma, and Ruth went off to University of Washington. In December of 1940, William falls ill, and Ruth is forced to quit college and come home to take care of her father. William dies on December 19, 1940. William leaves what little he has left to his three children. And the curse? Well, it seems to have destroyed Horace Harold and William Hegemeyer's lives. The Hegemeyer 1912 Craftsman sat vacant for more years than lived in. Each previous owner lost the home due to economics. In 2014, the property was once again purchased from the bank. In 2015, William's grandson, then 88, visits the home of the late William Hegemeyer and shares stories of his colorful life. The curious stones, which were first uncovered in 1910 on Mount Baker, were said to be hidden on the property. There had been three families of William's descendants that passed through the Hegemeyer home and all failed in locating anything resembling the curious stones. Reminiscence of holes in the walls and ceiling are still visible as family looked for the stones before moving from the home. On August 21, 2019, after removing a 50-year pile of debris, the owner of the property dug up the curious stones of Mount Baker. 